Right, um, welcome to this ECR training and development session. This session is entitled Anti-Racism and Student Mental Health. And it's co-facilitated, well co-facilitated, it's facilitated even by, by me, um, Aniska Sohol. I am a master's graduate from the University of Oxford and I'm a trustee for Student Minds, the UK student mental health charity. I'm the founder and director of a multilingual experience with our spin off, a multilingual experience at school, focusing on helping schools to create anti racist and inclusive environments to ensure all students feel as though they belong. This includes reforming mental health support for students at school to ensure it is more minority literate. This is achieved through working with minority students, whether that be racialized or LGBTQ students for example, and then working with them, we then co-create services that are informed by lived experiences. Starting next week, actually, I'll be Minds, the UK's mental health charities, new communities equalities lead. I'll be leading the charity's work on better supporting marginalized communities, examples including racialized, LGBTQ+, working class communities, and their access to mental health support. I'll be using my existing skills to co-design better services that are more minority literate, bringing those traditionally marginalized to the center of the mental health sector. I am the founder and presenter of the University of Oxford funded research project and podcast, All Things Mental Health. This work dismantles leading findings on student mental health by working with a consortium of clinical psychologists, policy advisors, researchers and more in podcast episodes. I use the interactive medium of podcast production to make these findings accessible and engaging for students on a grassroots level, supporting students with their mental health. Two episodes from series two explore anti-racism and student mental health more acutely, one entitled Inclusive Educational Spaces and the other Marginalization in Student Support Services. We will explore these more so later on. I'm currently a project manager for a podcast collaboration project with Smarten at King's entitled Keeping Students in Mind, Understanding Student Mental Health Research. This work sets out to bridge the gap between students' lived experiences navigating mental health problems in higher education with work undertaken by Smarten researchers in the sector. Students are interviewing researchers about their work, as well as its links with the students' in own interests in student mental health. Students produce, present and edit their own episodes and are supported through our mentoring scheme. Our aim is to create a series for students by students. This series of Smarten will be released in March, so do look out for it. Our Spotify information can be found on the third line down. You can check out our Instagram too, noted on the first line, to keep up to date with all our news and episode releases. As a trustee for Student Minds, I've been working as a co-facilitator for the charity's Students of Colour focus groups, working with POC students across the country on how best to dismantle barriers to accessing mental health support at university for racialized students. I've also co-facilitated the new mental health service provision for Student Minds, linked to their free digital platform for students as they navigate COVID-19, entitled Student Space, COVID-19 and Student Mental Health, supporting the most impacted students. Our Student Mind sets out to support all students in higher education. We want to ensure our services are authentically global and can effectively support the diverse mix of students currently in higher education in the UK. I co-facilitated this work with Rosie Tresler, the CEO of Student Minds, we will explore both pieces of work more so later on, drawing your attention to current work in the sector on anti-racism and student mental health. In this training session, I will explore the importance of harboring a quality, diversity and inclusion approach to student mental health research with a particular focus on anti-racism. I will draw on anti-racism work. I'm co-facilitating with Student Minds, as just mentioned. I will also consider how to authentically diversify research through a collaborative approach, for instance, through working with minority-focused mental health organisations, 
who could also offer a more global sample size, ensuring researchers undertake a more representative approach to student mental health data. I will share my adopted research method with ECRs to consider how they too can ensure they use truly global sample sizes in their work, making certain all students benefit from and are heard in student mental health research. Before we explore the importance between anti-racism and student mental health work more so, let's consider how is racism and anti-racism theoretically understood? This then allows us to apply the theory in practice to my, to my examples of anti-racism and student mental health work I've conducted in the sector, considering how this work is linked to leading theoretical ideas around anti-racism and racism as its direct opposite. As a master's graduate, I'm keen to ensure my work is grounded in leading theoretical ideas that fuse with practical application, ensuring global concepts around anti-racism and diversity are helping those students in higher education on the ground who are the most marginalized. Ibram Kendi is a black American historian and author of the 2019 leading book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Kendi says, racism is a marriage of racist policies and racist ideas that produces and normalizes racial inequities. So broken down simply into an equation, racist policies plus racist ideas equal racist inequities. Let's break this down further by working backwards. Through understanding the meaning behind each term, we can then put the equation back together and consider it in relation to student mental health. So put simply, racial inequity is when two or more racial groups are not standing on an approximately equal footing. A racist idea is any idea that suggests the racial groups are not equals in all their apparent differences. And a racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. And let's piece it all back together then. So each component then comes together to form this equation, as we just saw, racist policies plus racist ideas forms racist inequities. The solution then, the only remedy, Kennedy says, to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. And what does anti-racism look like in direct comparison? You can compare them as we go using the table on the screen. So an anti-racist idea is any idea that suggests the racial groups are equals and all their apparent differences. And what I find quite interesting about this particular idea here is it's, it's basically sort of direct opposites coming together. You're ensuring that your, racist, your, your different racial groups are considered as equals, but they're not assimilated. There is an understanding around they all have apparent differences, they all have different histories, they all have different relationships to, um, you know, different ideas around, you know, systemic marginalisation within different services, different universities, institutions. So we're understanding that, but we're also giving them an equal footing. Um, and consequently, that particular, that first box on, on the left hand side about the anti-racist idea is essentially then in a sort of clear cut phrase unity and diversity is what that's trying to pinpoint and say. So moving along then, an anti-racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial e equity between racial groups. And then racial equity is when two or more racial groups are standing on a relatively equal footing. So moving through. Kendi then uses this formula to argue there is no such thing as a non-racist or race neutral policy. Every policy in every institution, in every community, in every nation is producing or sustaining either racial inequity or equity between racial groups. And my, my kind of question here is, okay, how? The very answer to that and why is this theory relevant to student mental health can be answered in tandem. The answer, because of colonial knowledge. Every public body in the UK, from schools to universities to charities, with all three providing different types of mental health support, are founded off of colonial knowledge. Consequently, such institutions and organisations are not designed for a racially diverse population, 
or any form of minority for that matter, its founding principles set out to uphold the interest of the white majority and the archetype for all these public bodies as a white male. So yes, public bodies are not inclusive of the minority differences because most importantly, it is fundamentally not designed for them in mind. This is why there is a need to dismantle barriers to accessing mental health support for racialized students, for example, and why there is a real need to reform these services so they can support global communities within the UK. Student mental health services set out to support all students in higher education, but they desperately fail to do that because they're not for all students. They are not equipped for global majorities, they don't understand minority differences, and they don't effectively represent different racialized communities. This is why there's a desperate need to think about anti-racism and student mental health. Why there is a desperate need to undertake research that is inclusive, because the systems themselves are already geared against any form of minority. And there's a student mental health crisis out there and we need to learn how to support everyone. To mix things up, let's have a listen to what Dr. Manuel Madriaga has to say in the All Things Mental Health episode from series two, entitled Inclusive Educational Spaces. Manny is a senior lecturer in education studies at Sheffield Hallam University. His research interests are on the process of social exclusion and inclusion related to race, ethnicity and disability. Have a listen to what Manny has to say through two short clips. Just going to make sure my volume is up so you can hear it properly. Okay. So it's difficult for me to disentangle the British university system from colonialism, which continues to exist today. In terms of well being, it's students who are racialized and who are students of color, it's difficult to negotiate the corridors, the spaces within universities and seeing what they've been exposed to throughout their life uh, in education. When they come to university, all they see, they may see is a lot of white lecturers and also more white students around them. And it follows on over here. Students coming into a classroom are not empty vessels, yeah? Each one of us are bringing something different inside that room. And the way that we teach education or a way that some folks, some of my colleagues approach a lecture or a seminar is that they're empty vessels and they're not. They have experienced stuff that we don't know. And, and much of the literature that I have been drawn to is, is, is a lot of communities within inner city America where in order to uplift and encourage, we, gotta, we have to meet where the young children are at. I really like what money has to say here because with the first clip, he is essentially supporting what I was saying about how universities are founded off of colonial knowledge. And Manny and I expand upon this point more so in the episode, which you can listen to. And essentially the entrenched problems this then creates and essentially why we're then having sessions like these today. And then alongside that in the second clip, Manny is also trying to explain how we need to humanize students. I think this is something that is relevant to any student, whoever they might be, whether they're part of the white majority in the UK or they form a minority in the UK, perhaps they identify as a racialized minority or LGBTQ plus or even intersections between different minorities as well, creating a new type of identity. And how can we actually understand that these students, as Manny beautifully puts, aren't empty vessels they come into any form of classroom, whether that's a tutorial at a university or at school, with a story. And so how can we understand that each student is different? They might be able to relate to another student who's also a minority, but their particular struggle is different to someone else's. So it's ensuring that when tutors engage with, or pastoral care at universities engage with students, they can try and humanize them and understand they are very much individuals with their own lived experiences, their own human experiences and stories while forming a part of a wider community of students too within higher education. And let's move down to the next slide. 
So what's the link then to what Manny is saying to student mental health research more broadly and all the points that we've been thinking about and pulling through earlier as well? Essentially, there is a lack of understanding and exploration around delivering research that encompasses the experiences of all students within higher education. Sample sizes aren't global, despite the global majorities within the student community in higher education. Let's turn to another podcast episode to explore this more so. Again, from series two, we have the episode Marginalization in Student Support Services. This time, I was in conversation with Adam Morali Younger. Adam is training to be a counsellor, and he also works in the wider student mental health sector with an interest in diversification. He is a student mental health partnership manager, managing the Bristol Partnership, one of five regional partnerships funded through the Office for Students is Mental Health Challenge Competition. Listen to what Adam has to say about the need to diversify research. Do you think that university council services are modelled around the idea of an archetypal white British student and therefore this systematic marginalisation within the service is so embedded into its history that it's very difficult to, in many ways, um, to completely dismantle this um, because actually the whole thing perhaps is designed around that. To sort of widen it out, I think the profession overall appears to me as being modelled in that way that is, I remember reading, and I know it's a sort of like not the most modern of statistics, but from 2008, and there was this researcher who looked at six leading psychology journals so like the psychology area which covers counseling um in the us and i think he found that 96 percent of the papers submitted to there were from countries um that only represented and it just moves on here 12 percent of the global population and then within that you've got to think of the type of people that are usually getting involved in psychological research so uh, i remember like this they, they've come up with an acronym for it um weird is uh i hope i get this right western educated um industrialized rich and democratic now 2008 so that took in i think uh it was six journals across five years so maybe 15 20 years on from that I don't see those statistics having been shifted greatly, but researchers now need to start doing that and being aware that there maybe are different experiences. I think what Adam is saying here that really sort of hits home with this statistic, he's saying that you've got these, you know, these six, this the stat that he draws on, he's looking at these six psychology journals that span across, you know, global trying to anyway understand global issues and trends in in psychology and counseling 96 percent of the papers only represent 12 percent of the population how on earth are you understanding what the rest of the globe or the, or the rest of the global communities are even you know thinking how they're struggling in terms of counseling psychology we have no research on that and i think what's interesting about the uk is it's such a cosmopolitan and global university community within higher education. It's so diverse, whether that's international students, whether that's different minorities who are born and brought up in the UK. There are so many different students and there is hardly any awareness around all of those different ideas. And I think consequently, this is why research in many ways, to some extent, is not always relevant to majority of students. Um, and, you know, while the statistic is from 2008, Adam and I expand upon, this, expand upon this, sorry, more in the episode that where's the change? Like, have we actually seen any more global ideas explored in, in these areas that actually try to better understand the, this sort of more holistic picture of student mental health? So moving, moving forward then, let's go down to the next one. Okay, so how can we apply this theory in practice to help harbour an anti-racist approach to student mental health research? 
One is, is the need for global sample sizes. So currently, as we we're talking about, the majority of sample sizes used for student mental health research fail to represent the diversity within the student community in higher education. So readings are not holistically accurate, representative or authentically anti-racist. What's the solution then to this, to this problem? Big question, but what, what is the solution? The solution is, is collaboration. Get everyone in the room. So my work co-facilitating student minds is student space, COVID-19 is student mental health, supporting the most impacted students, set out to effectively achieve this in practice, and we managed to do just that. To improve support for marginalised students and disadvantaged groups during the pandemic and beyond, we set out to harbour a global and inclusive approach to student mental health nationally through Student Minds as national reach, working across higher education. Through a study into the most impacted students, we recognise that these groups mainly consist of racialised LGBTQ plus and working class students. We wanted to ensure that the minority literate mental health services we set out to provide were informed by lived experience leadership from a wide range of racialised and other disadvantaged and marginalised communities to ensure authentic and credible co-creation. Co-creation that fuses student minds as national reach with specialist understanding around diverse student groups who best understand their needs and requirements during the pandemic and beyond. To, to achieve this, we ensure this project was rooted in collaboration. We worked with leading organisations with a few listed on here. I'm just going to talk you through them as well. So we've got Taraki in the corner at the bottom. Taraki, which means progress in Punjabi, sets out to support Punjabi students within the South Asian community, more so within higher education through peer support groups, um, counselling, lots of different services. And then we work our way up. We've got Muslim Youth Helpline, who set out to support young Muslims in the UK, um, again, through some peer support bits, but mostly through a helpline that, that is free and accessible to Muslim young people. And then you've got Black People Talk, and the spin-off of Black People Talk is Black Students Talk that works in universities um, with a big, big, big um, sort of developed group in King's in particular, which you might have heard of linked through as well, because of course Martin are based at King's, um, supporting Black students in higher education. And again, through a real developed um, sort of different varieties, I guess, of services as well. So again, You've got your peer support groups, some focus groups as well to understand the issues students are facing and tackling these um, in practice as well, uh, taking, taking on board the feedback and then helping to redevelop ideas, one-to-one -one support as well, um, and then also signposting to other services that perhaps these particular organisations don't focus on um, that have links to, to other bodies as well. So through effective group facilitation, we co-produce support services for students through workshops and peer support groups. The specialist organisations who work with different minorities led the creation or further development of existing mental health support to better support the most impacted students during the pandemic. They are the experts on the diverse groups of students within higher education. Student minds can understand national patterns in student mental health, that these organisations understand the needs of different minorities on the ground and how best to support them. This collaboration also allowed for authentic representation as directors and CEOs from these organisations who we are working with are from the same minority background the organisation sets out to support. In addition, the students we engage with to help provide feedback on the services designed were also from these diverse communities we were collaborating with. This enabled us to ensure we were listening to all students. I co-chaired the launch of this new initiative with the CEO of the charity, Rosie Tresler, rolling the service out to thousands of users nationally back in 2021. And this was, this was in April 2021. And these services are still being used by students from across the country today. So how can this example be used to inform student mental health research? Over Student Minds, we use a diverse sample size to better understand the reality of all students in higher education. 
through this, we could create services that genuinely set out to better support all students created with them in mind, with services being minority literate from its very root. I would encourage researchers to work with such organisations when it comes to gathering a holistic global sample size of the UK's diverse student community in higher education. This allows for more accurate readings and studies which don't just set out to support your staple white student. What about all the other students? Student mental health research will never be able to be effectively applied in practice if it cannot support all students and fundamentally wasn't created with the accurate, diverse higher education student community in mind. So how can we take authentic representation further, bearing in mind the need to amplify minority voices too? Focus groups. Focus groups work well for this, allowing for true, authentic and original student voices to come through from a grassroots level to help inform research or co-production or redevelopment of student mental health support services. Along with Black People Talk, I co-facilitated focus groups at Student Minds for students of colour in collaboration with Coventry University. Student Minds sets out to work out how to better support racialized students with their mental health at university devising strategies to dismantle barriers to accessing mental health support for POC students in higher education. The findings are both used for a research project at Coventry University and to help reform student mental health services nationally at universities through Student Minds. Facilitated by POCs in the sector who work closely with racialized students across their work in mental health, this work harnessed the lived experiences of students from racialized backgrounds to work out ways to better improve student mental health support for a diverse range of students. The informal setup of these five focus groups spanned from December 2021 to the end of January 2022. And they were, con they were conversational in practice with relaxed introductions, stressing that this is a safe and comfortable environment to share if students so wished. As a result, students were open, supporting each other, discussing their lived experiences and working together to best work out how to use these human stories to dismantle barriers to accessing support. Students from across the country were invited and they received a voucher for their time. The opportunity was shared across universities across the country and we contacted BAME societies at different universities and different cultural societies to attract a wide range of students to include the voice of as many POC students as possible. Networking and reaching far and wide was key here to best learn from as many POC lived experiences as possible. Over half of the focus groups were fully booked and it was great to see so many students interested in making a difference. Co-creation was also vital here learning from the students, working together to imagine services that are more inclusive and globally aware. Facilitators were using their positions working for different charities to help imagine these ideas into existence. Ideas were shared with student minds in Coventry who are working on making these ideas possible in practice. So let's pop to the next slide to see some example discussion questions from the focus groups for students of colour that, was that were used to help prompt discussions in the sessions. So we have here, this was a, basically a slide lifted from the focus groups for you to see. So the main sort of umbrella question was, what do you think are the main issues students of colour face in relation to mental health support or university? And then we had a breakdown of, of, of other questions. So you've got, what changes do universities need to make to help support this? What barriers do you think students of colour face in relation to accessing support? Do you have experiences yourself of using such services? What sort of support services would you like to see to better support students of colour? What do students of colour want staff to know when it comes to mental health and wellbeing? These questions provided a great framework to help prompt discussion. As they're quite open-ended, it helped to open up the conversation. So it's great to see the domino effect of one student sharing their lived experiences, but then encourage so many other students to do the same. Focus groups are an effective strategy to gather findings, evidence, and co-develop ideas 
to ensure a diverse mix of participants, I would advise researchers to be clever with their networking, contact different universities across the nation to gather an accurate national picture, but also contact university societies that represent the different diverse student communities to help ensure all voices are heard. Even a simple graphic that different societies can share on their social media platforms can go a long way. This is how we manage to have so many fully booked focus groups over at Student Minds. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Any questions or comments, please feel free to fire away. I know we've got a little discussion session now as well. It would also be really lovely to hear from all of you as well, a little bit more about the work that you do. Um, and like I said, to open the floor up to any form of discussion as well. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Anisha. That was just yeah, really informative. And it sounds like you're doing an incredible amount of work as well. So hats off to you for kind of managing all of this.